special little girl this morning. And Robbie is going to lead us in that. Robbie, will you lead us? I'm going to invite uh, Brandon and Angela and Lily and baby June to come on up. Uh, as they're coming, you all clap for me, and that was ridiculous. But I do make my students do that for me every morning now at school. So uh, as they're coming up, I just want to read some scripture this morning uh, out of the book of Mark. So I like this when we're talking about children, and sometimes we don't even think about children coming to the Lord. But it says, people were bringing their little children to Jesus to have them touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I will tell you the truth. Anyone who does not receive the kingdom like a little child will never receive it. And he took them and put them in his arms, put his hands on them, and he blessed them. As we come this morning to dedicate June, we just think about those words and how important it is for a baby to be raised in a Christian household. Um, as I do school teaching now, I see kids, and you can totally tell the difference on, on the students that had parents that uh, teach them the Word of God and teach them the values of Christianity as opposed to those that, who have never heard the Word of God. And I just appreciate you all uh, bringing June forward this morning. I uh, just have a couple of things that I want to uh, get you to agree to as we make a pact with God uh, in, in this church. Uh, Brandon Angela, do you dedicate June Asher to the Lord who gave her to you? As well as, do you promise to provide for her the physical, emotional, and spiritual need for June? Uh, do you pledge as parents that with God's fatherly help, you will bring June in the di discipline and instruction of the Lord, making every reasonable effort with patience and love to build the word of God, the character of Christ, and the joy of the Lord into her, her life? Please answer, we do. We do. All right. Uh, family of God and church members, uh, I would ask for you to agree to this as well. Do you pledge that with God's help that you will bring June into the discipline and instruction of the Lord, making every effort with patience and love to build the word of God, the character of Christ, and the joy of the Lord in her life? And if you do, please answer, we do. All right, with that agreement, we're going to ask Pastor to come and pray over baby June. But before we do, uh, we have a a small token of our appreciation. We have a rose for Angela, and we just symbolize that rose with uh, the delicate life of a child and how much that she means to not only you all, but to this church family, but more importantly, she means to God. Uh, Lily, we didn't want to leave you out. We got you a, a carnation, and you just remember that you have a big responsibility as an older sister to watch out for her, to set a good example for her, but most likely... Uh, train her to be a follower of Christ. Brandon, I'm going to give you the certificate of dedication just so you can hold something else besides this monster baby right here. Isn't she precious? Uh, Pastor, if you'll come. Amen. Do you think I could hold June? Working out. <laughs> oh, I know. Join me as we dedicate June to Jesus. Almighty God, thank you so much for the precious life that you have given to the Franklins and that I have the privilege to pray and to dedicate to you. Thank you, Father, for uh, your blessing upon them. We dedicate June to you. Lord, may you keep your hand upon her. May you protect her. Lord, may you keep her safe. We know her family will be diligent, but Lord, we know that uh, they need your help, so we pray. We pray, Lord, as we dedicate her to you, that you would begin to reveal her plan that you have for her to, to Lily, to Angela, to Brandon, to this church family. And God, that we would facilitate what you want to do in her life. Lord, today we give her to you, and we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Get you a kiss, Ron.
if the ushers would go ahead and come forward. Um, Thank you again for being here this morning, and um, as they're coming forward, I just wanted to share a few quick announcements. Um, We will, you have all the announcements in your worship folder, but um, some few things that we want to highlight is that we will have no evening activities up here, so no students, no children, no adults, there will be nothing here this evening. Just stay, um, stay warm and spend some time with your family. And also the women's group meeting that was planned for Tuesday is now canceled. So just a few things to highlight for you. Um, And while they're also passing that around, we want to read a scripture to focus in this morning. As this morning, Pastor Gary is going to be talking about worship and how we can um, follow Jesus through worshiping. And so if you would turn with me to John chapter 4. And we're going to be in verses 19 to 24. John chapter 4, verses 19 to 24. I'll give you a second to turn there. It says, Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it, at, claim it here at Mount Gerizim, while our ancestors, where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, Believe me, the time is coming... When it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father here or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know so little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, and it is already here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for anyone who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, who, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. If you'll pray with me, and we'll get ready for worship. God, we just thank you for just an awesome morning where we can dedicate babies, we can come here and worship you, Lord, and just um, worship everything that you're doing. We pray that you'll be with Pastor Gary, God, as he's going to bring us just to your throne room, Lord. We pray that you will just give him the words to say, and Lord, we pray that our hearts will be so ready for what you have for us, and we ask all of these things in your name, amen. Amen. Thank you. The key component that was taken from Matthew chapter 28 for making more followers of Jesus Christ is go, baptize, and teach. We talked about go the last time. As we go through life as followers, we must see everyone, and here it is, this is what we need to remember, we must see everyone as a follower of Jesus Christ or a potential follower of Jesus Christ. Everyone we meet fits in one of those two categories. They are either a follower of Jesus Christ or a potential follower of Jesus Christ. And that's the mindset that we go with. So let's talk about baptize. It is not uncommon to find Christians today that have not been baptized. But in the early days of the church, baptism was very huge. It was the unmistakable act that marked a person as a follower of Jesus Christ. Paul says this in Romans uh, chapter 6 verse 4. We were therefore buried with him in baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Jesus died and was buried in the earth. So a Christian is submerged in water, symbolizing that we have died to ourselves and our sin is covered by the blood of Christ. As Christ came forth from the tomb, we are raised out of the waters of baptism to a new life. When first century Christians took the step of identifying themselves with the death and the resurrection of Jesus, they were publicly declaring their allegiance to Christ. Francis Chan writes, and I quote, Baptism was a declaration that a person's life, identity, and priorities were centered around Christ and his mission. Baptism was an outward act of an inward reality, or baptism is an outward act of an inward reality, that our allegiance Our devotion and the essence of our life is focused upon following Christ. 
That's what it means to be baptized. And if you have not been baptized as a believer of Christ and you want to focus your passion, your priorities, and your life on Christ and his mission, then you are commanded and we are commanded to do so. Just as baptism is more significant than we may have thought, so teaching people to obey Christ also is a monumental task in this very much self-centered culture. The most important question that we can ask in the church, now there's a lot of important questions that we can ask in the church, but the most important question that we can ask in the church is what will God bless? Four words. Say that with me. What will God bless? Say it again. What will God bless? Let's find out what that is and teach and apply it. And in doing so, we will become better and we will make more. <clears throat> Now, I've summed it up into six words, and I'm not saying they're the only six, but it's six that works for me, and I want to talk to you about some of those for the next couple of weeks. These words is words that I believe is what the church needs, what people need. It's what God wants, and it's what God will bless. So here they are. They're in your worship folder. Here's these six words that, that when we ask the question, what will God bless... He will bless worship that is higher, believing that is greater, and surrendering that is deeper. So they're in your worship folder. Here's these six words. Worshiping higher, believing greater, surrendering deeper. So let's talk about this morning for the next 20 minutes, worshiping higher. Because if we don't get worship right, we cannot get believing greater nor surrendering deeper, correct. Hear that. If we don't get worship right, we will not believe greater. Our faith will not grow. And our surrender and humbling ourselves and surrendering to his will will not happen. De Evan read the scripture for you in John chapter 4, 19 through 24. There's a number of things that this passage teaches us about worship. And by the way, if you're looking for a text that is most concentrated, that's the one you want to look for. In four verses, the word worship is used ten different times. It is interesting to me when you look at this text and you think about the priority of worship, it is interesting to me that in the midst of heightened real-life madness for so many people, Jesus talks mostly about worship. Again, four verses Ten times he uses the word worship, and it's the same Greek word. Now think about what's going on here. The woman has major relational and moral issues. She is struggling with a serious guilt complex. She skates around being truthful. She needs salvation. In fact, the whole town needs salvation. Jesus is thirsty. The disciples are hungry, for they have gone into town to buy food. There is a history of racial hostility and ethnic conflict that is ongoing and has been debated and is being debated, yet most of Jesus' conversation is about worship. You see, from where you and I sit, it seems the best way for Jesus to be relevant is to address the issue specifically. So why does Jesus follow this woman's diversion attempt and talk about worship? Here it is. Because when we get worship right, a lot of the other stuff we spend so much time trying to fix will get fixed, and it'll get fixed a lot easier, a lot sooner, and a lot better. To fail at worship is the greatest failure, listen, to fail at worship is the greatest failure that a human is capable of and has the gravest and most immediate consequences. Here's why that is true, and don't miss this. When worship is directed at an unworthy person or object, it is idolatry. That is one reason pride is such a stench to Almighty God. It's because pride always fuels idolatry. There is not idolatry without pride. 
It fuels idolatry, and it's the reason that it is such a stench to God. The first of the commandments, and you know this, forbids idolatry. You shall have no other gods before you. James McDonald writes in his book, Vertical Church, and I quote, Our greatest sin is directing our adoration elsewhere. Not only because it insults God, but also because it insulates our hearts from the delight that we were created to crave. I'm telling you, you were created, I was created to worship one God, and that's the God of heaven, the almighty creator. Just as jet engines were designed to run on jet fuel and not kerosene, we were designed to worship Almighty God, not flex deities. Hear that. When we become flexible with our deities, we are off center from life as God has intended us. And you may think, hey, I'm a Christian, and this flex deity is not an issue with me. Oh, yes, it is. I believe it is something that we must struggle and battle and be aware of and be vigilant and overcome consistently to have no other objects and no other gods in the place of Almighty God. The healthiest thing that we can do spiritually, emotionally, and physically is to worship Almighty God. And the worst thing that we can do for our overall health of our mind and our body and our soul is not worship God. I really believe, gang, I don't know, maybe too simple for us this morning, but I really believe that there would be a tremendous amount of physical, spiritual, and emotional health if we could get worship right. If Jesus came in person, we know he is here in us through the Holy Spirit, but if Jesus came in person preaching to our nation today, I believe some of the first words out of his mouth would be, you Americans worship what you do not know. And that's what he said to the woman and as uh, Evan read the passage. The greatest contributor to the decay of our country and what will ultimately be the downfall of our nation is misdirected worship. Before Adolf Hitler ever became to power and did the worldwide damage, there were several people that tried to make national and international leaders aware of his iron-fisted control and his evil intent. William Dodd, the American ambassador to Germany, was one of those. The reason, listen to this, you don't want to miss this, the reason national and international leaders would not touch him in his initial maneuverings were the German masses worshipped him. Women would weep in the streets when his car passed by. Men would save portions of the ground that his feet walked on. You see, the adoration and the loyalty that was given to Hitler insulated him from any significant rise of opposition. Listen, misdirected worship always leads to disaster, regardless if we're talking about a person or if we're talking about a nation. We are such a vulnerable nation and it is primarily because we Americans do not know what we worship. And until we fix uh, worship, we cannot fix our country. Until we fix worship, we cannot fix local congregations. The second thing from this passage is the defining of worship. The Greek word that is used in John 4 is proskuno. I'm sure glad Brother Bill is not here this morning. It's bad enough that Daniel is. He has some Greek, huh? But, but this Greek word, I think, is proskuno. It is used ten times in five short verses. It literally means to fall down and touch the ground with your forehead as an expression of adoration for someone. If I thought I could get back up, I would demonstrate for you what that would be. James McDonald writes this. Listen, worship is the magnification of God and the minimization of ourself. This is why we're having so much trouble with worship in our current culture is because we are really so self-centered as individuals. Amen? Amen. You see, worship is a recognition of who God is. That's not it. As, not only it, I should say. Worship is a recognition of who God is, but it's the acknowledgement of who we are. 
You see, if you have a wrong opinion of yourself, you're going to struggle with worship. Amen? If you have the wrong opinion of God, you're going to struggle with, with, with worship. And this is why we must fix worship. Worship is birthed as we see God real big and as we see ourselves real small. One of the most succinct expressions of worshipers' heart is in the entire Bible is from John the Baptist. Listen to these. He, Jesus, must increase, but I, John, must decrease. You want to get worship right? Start there. He must increase, but I must decrease. Worship is the actual act of ascribing worth to God. Yes, we do worship God with our displays of worshipful acts. For example, by giving a cup of cold water or giving a feeding the hungry in Jesus' name, Matthew chapter 25. Yes, we do worship God by our commitment to do his will, Romans chapter 12. But the worship that Jesus is talking about in John 4 is prescuno. When do we either literally or figuratively fall down and touch the ground with our forehead as an expression of our adoration to the Lord God Almighty? When does he get all that I am? When is our whole being engaged in the ascription of his worth? When do we get lost in how little that we are and caught up in how big that he is? There is a biblical reason that we have a worship service that is far more than just routinely coming to church. There is a sovereign mandate for each follower of Jesus Christ to have a worship experience that is far more than just going through the motions of liturgical activities. This is the designated time that we collectively assemble at this designated place corporately to ascribe worth to him. And when we do in spirit and truth, it is an unbelievable experience of transformation and an unforgettable moment of restoration. The Bible says, ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. I know that you have heard as I have heard. People say, I can worship as good at home as I can at the church. And that may be true, but let me tell you this. If that is true, you have never had church at church. You have only been coming to church. When minds and hearts get caught up in the adoration ascribing worth to the largeness of Almighty God, it is invigorating to the entirety of our being. When heaven comes down and glory fills our soul, it is refreshing to the whole person. When we cannot function because our burdens are so heavy with life stuff, yet we come into this house and we offer the sacrifice of praise to the Lamb of God and we worship the Lord. He renews our strength. We mount up with wings as eagles. We run and we do not become weary. We walk and we do not faint. That, my friend, is worship. And when you have had that experience, it is life-changing. It is invigorating. It is refreshing. It is renewing. It is transformational. And which this brings me to the final thing, simplifying worship. Jesus says in this passage that worship is solely to be directed to God the Father. The reason worship has gotten so complex and confusing is we interpret worship as a unique style, a type of music, the usage of certain instruments to our liking or not liking, or a service conducted a certain way. But listen, here it is. Worship is simply us throwing a truth and spirit party for Almighty God. Now, you all have had birthday parties, you've had uh, uh, Christmas parties, and maybe some of you before you met Jesus had some other kind of parties, all right? You've had, okay, you've had parties. And so we know that there is some essential components to have, for example, a birthday party. You're probably going to need a birthday cake and refreshments, okay? Well, listen, simplify it. What do we need? What is the essential elements for worship to happen? Here it is, truth and spirit. That's what this text says. Truth and spirit. We, we, and we'll talk a little more about that uh, next week as, as well. But So we come this morning 
And most of us come this morning and we demand something for ourselves out of this hour. But I would encourage you that next time you come to worship, or maybe you could just, maybe you could just kind of retrack it. But the next time you come to worship, I would encourage you to bring your soul and your mind and your body with the purpose of ascribing him the worth that is due to his name. And what you will receive from that hour will be memorable and life-changing. No matter how many or few uh, people that are in the pews worshiping, worship is always an audience of one. Nobody is on this platform, nor will they come to this platform, to do things that we like. No, the best question that we can ask as facilitators of worship is what will God bless? Rather than asking what do folks like, we ask what will God bless? What does God love? He's the audience, and he's the only one in the audience. Amen? I know, see, we, we've got worship confused and it's become complex because we've made it. And somebody wrote a song about it and we sing it every now and then. Forgive me, Lord, for making it about me when it's all about you. And that's worship. You're here this morning to join with those that will facilitate our worship time. You're here. We're all here to join with them to ascribe worth and honor to one almighty God who sits high and looks low. You see, when God loves our worship, here's crucial, crucial. When God loves our worship, he reciprocates it with his glory. You don't, you say, how was worship today? And, 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 and the way that we answer that question is, um, is, did the glory of God come among us? Was, was there transformation that took place in our life? Was there challenges in our life that, brought, that, that was going to challenge me to live my life in a manner that will honor Jesus Christ? Will, will, will what happened today make me better and will help me to make more? You see, again, when God loves what we do in this hour, and I know it's not limited to this hour, but it is, prescu- whatever that Greek word is, <laughs> uh, that we bow down it it is in this hour that we ascribe him worth if God loves that he will reciprocate that with his glory because here's why the Bible says God inhabits the praise of his people in other words he shows up where worship is in spirit and in truth and again, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, and him showing up is more than an emotional feeling. Okay, the Bible says, so we're getting ready to worship. The Bible says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Now listen, here is a summons from scripture that calls for the inner person to bless almighty God. You and I came in here praying this morning, God, would you bless us? Bow your heads with me right now. And I want you to pray this prayer loud, out loud. Here it is. It's very simply this. I'll give it to you, and and then you're going to pray it. The prayer this morning is not, God, would you bless us? But the prayer this morning is, soul, bless God. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And so would you just simply say, God, repeat after me, God, I'm here to bless you. God is not enhanced or increased by our worship, but the fact that our worship can bless him should stroke a fire of adoration in our soul that has not been kindled in a while. You, I can bless God. Amen. This is why church leaders must drill past the surface of pleasing our customers and go for what blesses God. I am not in denial that church can even that it, that church can or even should ignore people, but I'm under a deep conviction that we must be a church that assembles to bless God. For a church that blesses God with their worship, God will bless that church with his presence, and I can't wait. I used to think and I'm I'm done. 
I used to think, in fact, I've said it, the singing prepares the people's heart for the message. And I do believe singing and music and worship prepares our soul for the instruction of God's word. But we don't worship to make preaching more impactful for us. We preach so worship will be more impactful for Almighty God. So I urge you to get on your feet and, or get on your face or get on your knees, but by all means, let's get with it and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Lead us, gang. Amen. Let's do that. Let's stand to your feet and lift our voices to him who is worthy of our praise. Amen. 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 worship together as a group some of us like to raise our hands some of us like to clap some of us just maybe bow our head maybe there's a tear but no matter what it is even if you don't think you sing so good sing it loud and sing it proud if you don't get the words right if your heart's right it doesn't matter amen just this morning I want you to pretend there's no one else but you and the Lord and just let him have all of you this morning. Amen. Amen. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life. I won't turn back, I know you are dear Cause I will fear no For my God is here Yes, he is If my God is here Open 
worshiping him here but one day we'll be there amen amen
Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are the God that we can serve without reservation, without any question. You are the only true God. And God, I just pray that if we've come in this morning with a heavy